recognized symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Turn it on and rip the knob off. Guys, and welcome back once again to the Wrestling Memory Grenade. Now at episode number 107. I want to thank everybody who listened, tuned in last week to a very special bonus episode of the Grenade. It was also, in fact, the debut episode of our brand new podcast here on the WrestleCopia brand, The Wrestling Stoop, with the wrestling legend himself, Bob Roop. But we're back here this week on the Grenade, continuing on this 1987 project. Well, just about to finish it up. Only one more episode to go after this one as we begin to dissect the month of December of 1987 World Wrestling Federation Television here this week. And I am your host, Ray Russell, here to get the job done. But before we get to that, just a reminder, you guys can listen to the Wrestling Memory Grenade and our sister shows like Monday Warfare, The Battles Within, All About Raw vs. Nitro, that weekly episodic piece of business known as the Monday Night War, covering that Monday Night War one week at a time. Right now, just about creeping up on the one-year anniversary of Raw vs. Nitro, where in the summer of 96, the NWO was formed. WCW has started their reign of 83 weeks on top. Lots of fun stuff going on in Monday Warfare. Go back and check out the backlog of episodes. New episodes dropping very soon, guys. Also, listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories. Two projects going on right now and a third one on the way, guys. But right now, we're doing 1981 Georgia Championship Wrestling with guest co-host Jamie Ward, also doing Bill Watts' UWF in 1986 with guest Roman Gomez. Lots of fun times there. And like I said, a third project along the way there on Regional Rassens, so stay tuned for more details. And as I mentioned at the top of the show here, also got to mention our brand new podcast, The Wrestling Stoop with the legend himself, Bob Roop. Lots of great feedback on episode number one. And remember, guys, the Wrestling Stoop will not be in the Grenade feed. you got to go out and seek it for yourself. And it's pretty easy to do because you can listen to the Grenade, the Wrestling Stoop, and all of the above, everything I mentioned, and more, all part of the WrestleCopia podcast network located over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com. And hey, guys, I'm on social media, too. And you can follow me there for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia podcast network. Plus, I'm also constantly adding old school video clips and pictures from throughout wrestling history. You can follow me over on Twitter, or now it's X. You can find me there at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R A S S L I N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And while you're in it, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, guys. YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And before we jump into the fun, guys, last but certainly not least, very important to me. I've got to inform you guys that now would be a fantastic time to become a WrestleCopia patron. You can find me there at patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. That address again, patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. Talking about that $5 all access tier, guys. Get you so many gifts for just five bucks, including all of my insanely detailed book-like show notes, pages and pages of show notes, for every episode of The Grenade, Monday Warfare, and the Regional Wrestling Podcast. Plus, you'll get early access to many of the episodes here on WrestleCopia, where you can listen days, sometimes as much as a week earlier than the rest of the listeners. The first two episodes of Bob Roop's show dropped one week early. Regional Wrestling, last two episodes dropped five and six days early. And as the patron fans of this show knows, I typically try to drop The Grenade a couple days early when possible as well. But we're not done, guys. You also get remastered versions of the earliest episodes of this show, The Grenade Show, covering the 1989 NWA project. Includes enhanced sound quality, plus new content and conversation. Originally edited out of the initial broadcast due to time restraint, I put it right back into the show. But that's still not all. You also get digital downloads for your viewing and reading pleasure. And of course, our Patreon-exclusive watch-along series, covering many past WWF and WCW events plus random bonus video drops, and so much more. In fact, guys, a new watch-along series on the way coming soon. Stay tuned. 
as I, Ray Russell, and a myriad of co-hosts will soon begin watching videos. We're going to do live streaming, guys, and put it up on Patreon. As we watch the video, you guys can watch the video and watch us react at the same time and listen to our nonsense along the way. It's going to be a fun ride when we get there, guys. Coming soon this holiday season, so be on the lookout. But let's not forget, thanks to Patreon, now they have a collections area, which means everything is organized properly in their very own subfolder, which means all of the digital downloads now found in a digital download folder. All of the show notes in the show notes folder. You guys get the drift. So you get all of that, plus the very special WrestleCopia Patreon Spotify account. Allows you to listen to early access shows on Spotify. And yes, you get all of that for the low, low price of just $5. No subscription, cancel any time. Show your support. Give it a try for a month. I think you guys will like the content that I offer. And every penny of it goes right back here into paying the bills at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. So please, if you have a few bucks to spare, maybe you're looking to support a podcast brand, please consider making it WrestleCopia. So if you can, help me pay some of these bills to keep the WrestleCopia Podcast Network up and running for the months and the years to come. And now with all of that out of the way, guys, you know what time it is. Time to jump back into the 1987 machine. We're headed back to the month of December. We're going to kick off this week with the December 5th edition of the WWF's Superstars of Wrestling. All right, and here we are. Away we go. December 5th, Superstars tape back November 17th. Des Moines, Iowa at the Veterans Memorial Auditorium. We hear from Roger Newton, the building's manager, who appears excited to host the WWF. Then it's off to Vince McMahon, Jesse Ventura, and Bruno San Martino as we are shown clips from Saturday night's main event. More specifically, WWF champion Hulk Hogan taking on King Kong Bundy. We get a whiff of Andre the Giant's interference in that match and the upset countout win for Bundy. Hogan dropping Bobby Heenan after the match like a sack of, you know what, pal. So Hogan loses the match by countout to King Kong Bundy. A little help from Andre along the way, but Bobby Heenan pays for it. And now we're going to find out he's once again back in the neck brace here very soon. We'll see this weekend as we head off to the ring. Opening bout action. Tag team champion Strike Force. Yes, it's Tito Santana and Rick Martel taking on Los Conquistadores. And the Conquistadors now billed as being from somewhere in Latin America. Well, that's a step up from parts unknown, I suppose. As we get an insert promo here from Jimmy Hart and his Hart Foundation, Jimmy nauseous at the fact that Strike Force has his men's title belts. Hart's still wanting those title belts back. As on commentary, Jesse Ventura hypothesizes that maybe Tito Santana, somewhere along the way, he sold these mass conquistadors some bad tacos in the past. And now they're back for revenge. I wrote, wow, now there's a hot angle, Jesse. As Strike Force dominate the action early on, Jose Luis Rivera even accidentally dropkicking partner Jose Estrada off the ring apron. Strike Force continue their dominance with stereo backdrops, stereo dropkicks, sending both conquistadors over the top rope and out to the floor as the masked men then do a little switcheroo, the illegal one re-entering the ring, and the heels take over on Rick Martel in their corner. But it's Conquistador Estrada running into a Martel boot in the corner, and it's hot tag time to Tito Santana. As Santana comes in, lighting Estrada up, with Martel then back in, standing spine buster of sorts, turning it over into the Boston Crab. And as Tito fights off Rivera, it's Estrada who submits to the Boston Crab. Strike Force picking up a win, 3 minutes and 26 seconds. As we roll on, special interview with Craig DeGeorge standing by up on the platform with Greg the Hammer Valentine and his brand new manager, Jimmy Hart. And Valentine and Jimmy both discuss Greg being the master of the figure four leg lock as we go back in time just a couple weeks. Quick clip. We see Valentine taking out Brutus Beefcake with that figure four. As the heels now want Brutus Beefcake's Hedge Clippers banned from wrestling. Makes sense. You can do a lot of damage with Hedge Clippers. Never really thought of that as a kid. 
The Hammer says if it wasn't for those Clippers, Valentine, he would have broken Beefcake's leg and taken him out of pro wrestling. Sports entertainment, pal. But Valentine, he taught Beefcake everything he knows when they were the dream team, taught him everything he knows about wrestling, and took him to the tag team titles. As DeGeorge informs the heels that Brudai is vowing revenge, but the Hammer makes a vow himself to put Brutus out of wrestling for good. Because there's one thing that Greg has that Beefcake doesn't, and that's the killer instinct. So it laid dormant, and to some degree never really was settled. So here we are, more than eight months later, and the feud is back on. The Dream Team explode in this meta feud. As we head back to the ring, it's the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, accompanied by Bodyguard Virgil, taking on Omar Atlas here, as the announcers discuss DiBiase wanting to buy the WWF title. We even get an insert promo here from DiBiase, admitting he just bought himself the cover of the latest edition of the WWF magazine. Meanwhile, in the ring, Omar Atlas shows a chance to shine, but DiBiase counters a headlock with a nice back suplex, becomes the aggressor in the matchup. Teddy blocks an Omar hip toss, Counters with a stiff-ass clothesline. DiBiase then drops a falling back elbow off the middle rope. Got to pick up the win here for the Million Dollar Man. Two minutes and nine seconds. As now we are off to Craig DeGeorge, standing by with Ho Hacksaw, Jim Duggan. Okay, hi again, everyone. Well, he uh, indeed is one of the great stars in the World Wrestling Federation. Always behind him is that two-by-four. Come on in, Hacksaw, Jim Duggan. Yeah, we're over I'm here. I'm looking around, Craig. Got to keep my head on a swivel, because sometimes old Hacksaw Jim Duggan, I get a little bit excited, I lose my composure, I start jumping around, the hair on the back of my neck stands up, and I get a chance to grab a hold of a weasel and pull him in close and get a look at him. Well, as I recall, it was that type of thing where somebody was behind you in that conversation. I had You're right, Craig, I kind of got baited. I kind of, old yeah. Bobby Heenan was sacrificing himself, figured it played on Hacksaw Jim Duggan's kindness. Because I didn't blast him right away. I kind of did a little talking to him when I had him up close. Let Harley Race sneak up from behind me. Let Harley Grace grab my two by four. And then? And let Harley Race work me over pretty good with it. Beat me up pretty bad, Craig. I was laying down there on the concrete. The building was spinning. The crowd was yelling. And all I could see was Harley Race standing over me with his big two by four. Blasting me. Oh, excuse me, Craig. Hit you that hard. I get excited sometimes. He was blasting me with it. Not once, not twice, not 15, oh, 25 times. Many, many, times. many times. You were standing right there, I believe. Yes, I, was. I can't remember because it was all a blur. But Harley Race, all you did was embed your name in the hacksaw Jim Duggan's mind. Yeah, old hacksaw may not belong in no cover of GQ magazine uh -huh. or no cover of Muscle and Fitness magazine, but I'm not ashamed to go in any gym in the country and the way I dress is just fine with my folks. Ho! That was for my folks out there. All right, well, that was very nice. Yeah. Hacksaw Jim Duggan, King Harley Race did bait you. He did hit you. But another thing, at least he got that crown back. You didn't even want that thing, that room. No, I hey, think... I just kind of took that crown away from him to embarrass him, to kind of bring him off that pedestal he puts himself up on. He thinks he's a little bit better than everybody else. Thinks he's better than all the working folks out there. Doesn't even like to look him in the eye. Walks down to the ring playing that fancy damn music. Has that cape flapping, flapping in the back there. Has Bobby Heenan running all around him, whispering in his ear telling him what to do well race i'm sick and tired of it i know a lot of folks out there are sick and tired of it and we're going to do something about it all right tough Good guy Good way to take care of oh. royalty hacksaw jim duggan gotta love that meat and potatoes style that is only his and there it is the hacker talking harley race ah yes the king harley race hacksaw jim duggan feud continues on we haven't even got to the slammies yet guys Hacksaw admitting that he took the robe and the crown simply to embarrass the king as Harley comes down to the ring with that fancy damn music. No thanks, tough guy. And speaking of music, we're off to a music video featuring Andre the Giant. Could you imagine him singing? Well, he sang that fish song back on TNT years ago, but never mind. Instead, it's Andre the Giant, a music video set to the tune of Vince McMahon's Stand Back. If there's one guy you want to stand back away from, it could be Andre the Giant. Uh, as we come out of that music video, however, Jesse Ventura has a little fun here. Trashes the voice quality, the singer involved with that stand back song. How dare you, pal? As the action rolls on, it's Bam Bam Bigelow, Oliver Humperdinck in his corner, taking on Dave Wagner. And a recently clean-shaven Bam Bam here looks all business 
as he hops over the top rope with ease into the ring. To the tune of his new theme music, some big brass playing in the background. Bammer busting out a standing dropkick right out of the gate. Tears apart Dave Wagner from there before slamming in place for the bombs away. Slingshot splash from the apron into the ring. Going to give Bigelow the quick win. One minute and 22 seconds. Matchup quick, impressive, believable squash. Is Bigelow right out of the ring? Two loud cheers from the fans. As the show rolls on, I touched on it during the Strike Force match. But here it is now, Craig DeGeorge standing by with Jimmy Hart and the former tag team champions, the Hart Foundation. Well, the Boston Crab, you know, that is a very dirty word to bring up to my next guest. But, hey, that's the story, really. The Hart Foundation, along with the mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. And indeed, it was the Boston Crab by one Rick Martell not too many weeks ago that, that well, made us new tag team champions in strike force. Let me hear you some. Did you hear this man say, I quit? Did you I, hear I him not, say, I, I give? not ringside, I cannot answer that. Well, let's bring him in. This is the man that was in the Boston crap. Tell him, Jimmy, did you say, I quit, I give? Absolutely not. Case closed. Case I closed. didn't say one little peep. Nothing. Can you believe a man of my athletic capabilities with the Dallas Cowboys and the Oakland Raiders? I was the best shot putter in the world at 18. This man of my caliber, do you think I would say, I give up? Do you think that little French Canadian can put me in a Boston Crab and I'm going to just throw everything out the window on a Boston Crab? I'll tell you something. The closest the Anvil's ever come to a Boston Crab is the head janitor of the Boston Gardens. That's as far as he's ever come to seeing a Boston Crab. Now let me tell you something. The Hart Foundation, a lot of people think the Hart Foundation, that we're going to bottom out and go right to the bottom. Huh. That's what I think. The Hart Foundation is going to go right to the top. We're going to beat the strike force and take our belts back. And we're going to prove to everybody, everybody in the whole world, that we are the best in the entire world. There is indeed incentive. I think that's the point you're trying to bring up. Now, what do you know about a Boston crab? Huh? I know it all, Mr. Know it all. I, hey, Were you I, ever I, an athlete? What do you know about athletic prowess? Huh? What do you know about a Boston Crab? Oh, huh? the thing is what the rest of us saw, well, and that was the fact that he put a Boston Crab you, on you. You're you saying you and saw it, right? right? That's I'm gonna look at this right. You said you saw it. It's not something you see, it's something you hear. Well, let me, you hear. You hear. let me tell you something, baby. Just because you put matching boots on Tito Santana and Rick Martel, and you put the tights on them, and you put shirts on them, and you put music behind them, it won't make you a champion. And I promise you this. This is the greatest team in professional wrestling today, the Hart Foundation, and we will get our championship belts. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 we're going to get it back. There's no question about that. We are definitely going to get it back. Uh, a bit agitated, you might say, from yeah. one Boston crab from yeah, losing a it. couple of championship belts, the Hart Foundation. And I wrote LOL there at the Anvil's promo here about the Boston crab. Brett trying a bit of comedy, but I really didn't get the joke. Sorry. Better luck next time, Brett. And there will be a next time, guys. As the show goes on, we get some quick promos here from Sam Houston and Dangerous Danny Davis. Remember the wrestling challenge feud between the two? Well, it's bleeding over here a little bit onto superstars. Vince McMahon at least allowing them 30 seconds of airtime. As Dangerous Danny says, Sam Houston got lucky last time when he pinned him and challenging him here to a rematch, which Houston references his paw. Doesn't mention it by name, but his paw just happens to be Grizzly Smith, guys. And as you might guess, Houston accepting the challenge of Danny Davis. So look forward to that matchup or don't. As we roll on here, speaking of looking forward to things, here's a mixed bag. Some loved it, even more hated it. I'm talking about the new and improved Dino Bravo here. It's Dino Bravo out with his brand new manager, Frenchie Martin, scheduled to take on Siviafi, new manager and hey, new music for Dino Bravo as well. The newly turned singles wrestler Bravo, accompanied to the ring, yes, by the former wrestler, well, sometimes still wrestling, Frenchie Martin, to that familiar La Marseillaise, the French national anthem. 
even though Dino's only French Canadian and Italian descent, but it's wrestling. So why question it, guys? Always cool when another wrestler gets added a theme song. So we've heard Bam Bam in recent weeks, The Ultimate Warrior. Now Dino Bravo presented with the gift of music as well. As the match gets going, I haven't seen C.V. Afi in a while. Let's see how he fares here. C.V. actually does well early on, but runs into a Bravo clothesline out of the corner. Dino then going to take over. Lands his patented side suplex, followed by a folding back suplex. Just nasty, Dino. Bravo scoring the win. One minute and 46 seconds. Short, quick, to the point. That's the way I like my Dino Bravo squashes. As we're off now to update at Craig to George. Craig talking all about the Million Dollar Man's plans to buy the WWF title from Hulk Hogan. From the pages of the World Wrestling Federation magazine, here's Update with Craig DeGeorge. Hello, everyone. To say the spacious office building of World Wrestling Federation President Jack Tunney resembles the floor of the New York Stock Exchange might be putting it a bit on the mild side. There is hustle, bustle, and confusion, and there are plenty of questions, as Mr. Tunney and his staff now are preparing the official word on what could be one of the most noteworthy and certainly bizarre happenings ever to hit the WWF. I'm going to buy the World Wrestling Federation Heavyweight Championship. That's right, baby, it's gonna be mine. Lock, stock, and barrel. It was this comment by Ted DiBiase that has rippled through the World Wrestling Federation with an earthquake-like effect. However, at this point, we do not know how much damage has or will be done to the structure. Ted DiBiase is trying to buy, I repeat, buy Hulk Hogan's heavyweight championship. This potential move, obviously unprecedented, is raising all sorts of theories and questions. That the subject of my interview with President Tunney. It is highly irregular. No one has ever tried to buy the World Wrestling Federation Championship before. Mr. Tunney, what about Hulk Hogan? Has he received this proposal? Officially, I'm not sure. Uh, there are rumors going around that he has. I, I really don't know. Certainly the legality is a question. What about that? I'm looking into the bylaws now. I, I don't want to make any further comment on that now. All right, the legalities, of course, are a major issue here. Also, what about the hoaxer? Well, we've been unable to contact the WWF champ, and if he's watching right now, it is possible this is the first time he's heard about the matter, unless DiBiase has already contacted him. At this point, though, the questions abound and the answers do not. So we're left with speculation as to whether the Million Dollar Man can or will attempt to buy out Hulk Hogan. We'll update you on this next week. I'm Craig DeGeorge. So there it is. We then hear from WWF President Jack Tunney who apparently doesn't know his own rules, doesn't know the rules of the WWF, says he's looking into the bylaws. And at this point, isn't sure if you can even sell a belt or purchase a belt here in the World Wrestling Federation. Tunney also not sure whether Hogan has even heard about the offer. So we're a week removed from the storyline, DiBiase offering to purchase the belt. And apparently, Tunney not sure if Hulk is that aloof to the goings-on around here. But oh, the suspense. Fun story ahead. Stay tuned there, guys, as we are now alerted that the Slammies are coming. Yes, the 37th annual Slammy Awards coming on December the 19th. Check your local listings. Then it's back to the ring tag team action. British Bulldogs taking on Steve Lombardi and Barry Horowitz as the Bulldogs overpower and outwrestle their opponents early on. Dynamite with a nice looking snap suplex on Horowitz, but the heels finally take over after some cheap tactics, biting, eye gouging. Double teaming by Horowitz and Lombardi gives them control for a good chunk of time here. Honestly, Lombardi, though, lands a gut buster on the kid, but telegraphs a backdrop. And finally, Dynamite able to tag in Davy Boy Smith. And Smith in with a running drop kick and delayed suplex on Horowitz. Davy Boy then running power slam before Dynamite re entering the ring with a nasty looking folding back superplex, intentionally trying to fold Horowitz in half on the way down. You can tell by the positioning, not cool dynamite. Nevertheless, the Bulldog's going to pick up the win there after that back superplex on Barry Horowitz. And it was promised last time here, episode 106 on the grenade was promised by Vince McMahon, Gorilla Monsoon, whoever you want to listen to. We were told that this week we would have a major announcement from superstar Billy Graham. Here it is. 
Baltimore, Maryland, a decade and a half ago, superstar Billy Graham makes sports history by becoming the heavyweight champion of the world. But then, the superstar's wrestling career was put in jeopardy when he sustained a devastating hip injury and surgery superstar was required. Graham, my career will not be over, even though the surgeons told me, Superstar Billy Graham, your career is finished. You'll never wrestle again. But Superstar Billy Graham will come back. I am the survivor. Doctors and fans, millions of them around the globe, said it was over for the superstar. But he would endure. He would make a miraculous comeback. But it took awfully hard work. Then the superstar returns to the World Wrestling Federation. Paradise Valley, Arizona, weighing 268 pounds. Ladies and gentlemen, superstar Billy Graham. A standing ovation. They said it couldn't be done. They said he would never return, that he could not recover. Returning triumphantly to the World Wrestling Federation. But, again, the great Billy Graham would be tested. First by the natural Butch Reed in a nationally televised body pose down. And the superstar did endure. Then he was tested by both Reed and the awesome one-man gang. Superstar Billy Graham has been to the mountaintop. He's been the heavyweight champion of the world. He has nothing to prove to himself or to the millions that revere him around the world. Now the superstar is faced with the most difficult decision of his life. After all, how much can one man endure? So there you hear it. Mean Gene Oakland doing voiceover work here. We see clips of Billy Graham as the WWWF champion back in the late 70s. We see clips of his comeback, his promos, clips of Graham's hard work in the gym to achieve said comeback. We even get a glimpse of his in-ring return this past summer. And then we move on. Highlights of Butch Reed and the one-man gang seemingly taking the superstar out of wrestling just a few weeks ago. As Mean Gene says, after everything Graham has been through, how much can one man endure as we fade to black? My response to this quote-unquote major announcement was, wait a minute, what the fuck was that? We were promised last week, and going into this segment even, this week, a major announcement from Billy Graham himself. Instead, it's just a recap package with Mean Gene doing a voiceover. So we get no announcement, and worse yet, no Billy Graham. What gives, Vince? (laughs) Ha ha! Gotcha, pal! Is back to the ring one more time for the natural Butch Reed. Slick in his corner, taking on Outback Jack. And we get an insert promo right away from Don Morocco talking about Butch Reed mocking Graham after taking him out. The Rock, in his own words here, promises that the natural will pay. As Slick dancing to the ring to Jive Soul Bro. And then the Slicks are going to distract Outback Jack, allowing Butch Reed to attack. Jack does try a comeback, but gets cut off as Reed dominates. Outback going to finally try a little offense, coming with a clothesline out of nowhere. Very rough-looking clothesline here by Jack. But Reed, however, catches Jack charging in the corner, and then it's the top rope clothesline, finishing Outback off in just two minutes and five seconds. Sorry about your push here, Jack. No worries, mate. I'm Outback Jack. As we close out this edition of Superstars, Craig to George standing by one more time. This time it's with the Doctor of Style Slick, and his one-man gang. Well, when you talk about top contenders in the World Wrestling Federation for the Heavyweight Championship, one of the names that comes to mind right away, my guest at this time, the uh, one-man gang, Dr. Style, come on in, the slickster. Well, he's 483 pounds and uh, one of the biggest and one of the best. I'll, I'll have to give you that much. Well, you know, you turned out to be quite a precise individual. A compliment? Let me bring the big man in. Just in case there's anybody who has any doubts. Now, you see this man standing here? You can't miss him. (laughs) This man is not to be toyed with. And you know, Hulk Hogan, you found that out, but you had to find it out the hard way. So again, you've got to step in the comeback zone. You've got to do battle with wrestling's premier super heavyweight 
the big 747, the tenacious one-man gang. Yeah. A man who fears no man walking the face of this earth today. Hey, I want to ask you about that punishing maneuver when the 747, well, Hulk has said sometimes comes for a crash landing, but you know what I'm talking about. The master blaster, yeah. brother. That's exactly what it's called, the master blaster. That's where he takes the man and he picks oh. him up and he drives him face first into the mat. And you know what, Hulk? He's going to do it to you. He's going to do it to you because, Hulk Hogan, it's time for a change. It's time for a new heavyweight champion of the world. And there's no one else, no one else in the World Wrestling Federation who holds the credentials. No one else who possesses the ability to put you on the mat, your shoulders to the floor for the three count, brother, but the one man game. You know, it would be interesting to get a comment from the one-man gang, wouldn't it? You see, well, what's brother, go I do all the talking because I pay all the bills. I I'm the reporter here. Can't we get a comment? No, I said. Well, I'll tell you one thing. We can get some, some real tough, tough steel, if you will. Big man, 483 powder, the one-man gang. So Craig can't seem to get a word with the gang here, but he has no issue getting anything he needs from the Doctor of Style. As Slickster says, Hulk Hogan, look out. Slick's still trying to get over the Master Blaster, that Gourd Buster, as a finisher here for the gang, even though in recent weeks we've seen him use that 747 splash. That's going to change here on this set of TV tapings, as you guys will find out as we move on the following day, December 6th, and Wrestling Challenge. <laughs> So here we are, Wrestling Challenge, December the 6th, taped back November 18th, Omaha, Nebraska, at the Civic Auditorium. It's Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Monsoon on commentary. And as I mentioned earlier at the top of Superstars, Heenan once again back in a neck brace. All thanks to the clips we see here of Hulk Hogan attacking Bobby after the matchup against King Kong Bundy at Saturday night's main event as we're off to the ring for Ravishing Rick Rude in opening bout action. Rude going to take on Omar Atlas here as the injured Heenan will remain on commentary for this one. And Omar Atlas going to sneak up behind Rude with a schoolboy right out of the gate, starting the match off. One, two, Rude kicks out right away. Wow, that would have been an upset. From there, the ravishing one dominating the action, but he stops and allows Omar to take a few shots to the abdomen area, which obviously Rick Rude no-sells, before continuing control. And before too long, it is the body breaker. Yes, the over-the-shoulder backbreaker gets the submission win here. One minute and 49 seconds as Bobby Heenan continues his feud with Mr. Wonderful by tying his stretch figure into knots. And honestly, that might be one of the last times we hear the name Mr. Wonderful spoken here on WWF TV. It's up next on Challenge. It's special report with Craig DeGeorge. More talk of Ted DiBiase trying to purchase the World Wrestling Federation belt. Also, we get another Slammys promo before it's back to ringside for Jake the Snake Roberts taking on Barry Horowitz. And as Jake adjusts Damien's bag in the corner, Horowitz attacks. Barry, though, runs into a snake clothesline. And just like that, DDT out of nowhere ends Barry's night after only 55 seconds. And Damien out to play afterwards, but Horowitz luckily escapes. Perhaps the first enhancement worker to escape Damien at this point. Not sure if Barry just declined or if Jake was being cool here with Horowitz. Either way, the point of this matchup, Jake really not on the offense here. It was Barry attacking, Barry beating down Roberts for just a moment, and then DDT out of nowhere, showing you it can strike at any time and end the matchup. As right now, we're off to Craig to George. He's standing by with Jimmy Powers and Paul Roma, the survivors of the Survivor Series. Yes, it's the Young Stallions. All right, we're going to talk about the tag team situation in the World Wrestling Federation. Certainly some great competition for Strike Force, the new champions. You have the 
former champs, the Hart Foundation, the British Bulldogs, Killer Bees, the Islanders, some of the top teams in the tag team division. We're going to talk to one of the up-and-coming teams, no doubt about that. Everybody in the World Wrestling Federation very impressed with Paul Roma and Jimmy Powers. Come on in, gentlemen, the Young Stallions, as they're known. And for you, it's been a real climb up, a meteoric rise, if you will. Yeah, we're doing real well for ourselves, Craig. You know, we got the uh, we got new tag team champions now. The tag team scene has never been as strong as it is no. right now. We'd like to get back. We'd like to get our hands back on the Hart Foundation. We'd like one more shot at those guys. Well, you've had some impressive outings as well. Oh yeah, well, you know, I don't think just one hand, Jim. I think all four of our hands. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, tell you what. I think, uh, I think they'll give us that shot. They're not dodging us, and we're not dodging them, and uh, we'll just see what time will bring. And certainly the new tag team champions of Strike Force. I know you guys are impressed with them as well. Oh, we, love, we like the Strike Force a lot. We're very happy for them. We'd like someday to get in the ring with the Strike Force, have a nice match there. Yeah, that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Yes, I think it would be very interesting, Paul Roma. Sure, you know, just like he said. Uh, and I think they'll go for that, too. I don't see why not, yeah. you know. I think Great one of the things, like uh, Paul, that people are impressed with is the way you work together. Not all tag teams work together so well, and I guess that obviously is the key when you're talking about a team. We've been working real hard. Paul and myself have been training very hard in the ring and in the gym, and our teamwork has improved considerably, and that's what it's all about, tag team. We've been working very well as a team lately. And experience, I guess, is what you're talking about, just working together more and more and getting the experience together. Well, yeah, that's what we're lacking right now is experience. But, you know, as time goes on and as we work as a team, uh, it'll come. And, and we're, we're willing to wait. And you're willing to wait to go get those belts. What about what you have to do, perhaps, to get to the belts? Do you, do you think you're ready for the title shot right now, or do you, would you like to work your way up, if you will? Well, we've had a title shot against the Hart Foundation. We did very well for ourselves. I don't see yeah. why we shouldn't be able to get in that ring with the strike force right now. Yeah? Right now? You ready? You are my partner. All right, Paul Roma, thank you very much. The Young Stallions out of New York, top upcoming contenders in the tag team division. No question about that. They've looked good so far. In the future, perhaps, the belts fly. I guess we'll see you in that. Jim, Paul, thank you very much. They are the Young Stallions, up and coming contenders in the tag team division. So, Roma, the Stallions, apparently willing to wait for a title shot. But they'd also like to get that shot right now, says Jimmy Powers. He feels they're ready for strike force. Kind of felt a little ad-libbed, as all promos were in that point in time. But I mean, the bullet points here felt a little ad-libbed as Roma was caught off guard, apparently. It it, deer in headlights, like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> are we turning heel? And if so, I bet Paul Roma couldn't have waited for that one. It might have worked in time. Luckily, we will eventually get power and glory. But for now, it is the Young Stallions looking for their opportunity at Tag Team Gold. Is up next, guys. We got another promo for you. This time, it's from the Doctor of Style. Slick. Slickster, your thoughts on Ted DiBiase's proposal to buy the title from Hulk Hogan? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't like it. Who does he think he is? He's trying to buy this. He's trying to buy that. He's trying to buy everything because he's got all that money. And now he's gone so far as to try to buy the world's heavyweight championship. Well, let me tell you something. The one-man gang, the natural butch Reed, they ought to be the number one contenders because they can bring the world's heavyweight championship right to the slickster, daddy. Well, the slickster, extremely upset, Brain. What in the world is DiBiase attempting to do? trying to buy the championship of the world as far as i'm concerned that's reprehensible that's disgusting i i'm gonna i'm gonna check in more of this i don't like the sound of this at all so it would appear slick not happy with the discussion of ted dibiase trying to purchase the wwf title as slick feels the one-man gang and butch reed are the current number one contenders so even the heels are getting pissed off about dibiase trying to lay claim purchase the championship from hulk hogan Bob Heenan also had a few comments there. He'll continue on with more of that as the weeks progress. As up next here on Challenge, we go back to last week's Superstars, November 28th. It's the matchup between Brutus Beefcake, Greg the Hammer Valentine, ending in a schmoz before Greg Valentine attacking Beefer, locking in that figure four, trying to do permanent damage. The barber able to reach over and grab his hedge clippers and run the hammer off. So as I said earlier, the Dream Team explodes again, I suppose, as the feud would apparently be back on. Oh, here we, we got a fun one lined up now, guys. Up next, I got a soundbite, Craig to George standing by with the ladies champion. Here she is, the sensational Sherry. Well, not many people were aware of sensational Sherry, but I'll tell you something. When you beat the fabulous Moolah, immediately 
There's some success level that you've attained, and in this case, it was a championship belt. Come on in, Sensational Sherry. She is now the ladies' champion after beating the, the fabulous Moolah. Do you know what? This is the age of Craig D. George. This is the age of the sensational one because of the fact that I, I alone, me, myself, and I beat the fabulous Moolah. I pinned her one, two, three, right? That says a lot. The best, okay, the best I'm not forever. finished yet. That's right. I am the best one. Yet. That, well, that it wasn't exactly what I was alluding to. The fact that the fabulous Moolah over her career proved to be the greatest and certainly... She is not the greatest. I am the greatest. This is my interview time out here, so you say I am the greatest out here. The sensational one. Now, there are a few ladies out there coming around who pretend to be number one contenders. Rock and Robin, you can rock and rock and rock around the block all night long, but there are never come a day in your life to where you can come to beat or defeat me. She's a top contender. Also, what about uh, Debbie Combs? I think uh, you got to put her right among the top now. Debbie Combs, she's got more peroxide in her hair than the peroxide people have got on the shelves in the store. I want to know which company she put out of business. And last but not least, the fabulous Moolah. Yes, what about the... <laughs> I haven't talked to her recently. I know. <laughs> you know why you haven't talked to her? Because she's sitting at home knitting. She's sitting at home oh, knitting, and she's making spaghetti, and she's making cookies for every one of the other contenders and feeling sorry for herself. Um, That's what she's doing, and she's out there, and she's looking at herself. She's looking at me and remembering that I am the one that defeated her. I am the one that put well, an end to her 28-year uh, reign. Knowing her, right? her very well, I know she, she is probably gearing up for perhaps... Another shot, an unprecedented shot at getting the title back, the title that she's held for so long. That's your opinion. All right, she is Sensational Sherry, the ladies, World Wrestling Federation champion, certainly uh, most impressive when you beat someone like the fabulous Moolah, someone who's been around the ring for a bit. That, uh, that says a lot for Sensational Sherry, the World Wrestling Federation ladies champion. We're back with more in just a bit. So this is indeed the age of the sensational one, Craig D. George. Sherry name dropping some of the challengers, mentioning Mula, of course. Mula now in the rear view. It would appear here in the World Wrestling Federation, however. And Rock and Robin next in line, it would seem here based on the house shows. And did I mention, guys, the Slammy Awards are coming December the 19th before we head back to the ring for the King, Harley Race. And Bobby Heenan going to remain on commentary once again for this one as the King takes on Jerry Allen and Race straight away using a belly to belly suplex right out of the gate and a pile driver to soften Allen up, while a belly-to-belly -belly suplex and a pile driver, first two moves of the matchup. Talk about high spots, Harley. From there, it's a double underhook suplex and the cradle suplex. No bridge, gonna give the king the win in just one minute and eight seconds. His feud will continue, the king versus Hacksaw. Then from there, we head off to a special interview up on the platform, Craig DeGeorge standing by with Jimmy Hart and his man, Dangerous Danny Davis. Remember, we speculated on Saturday night's main event. Davis versus George Steele. Jimmy Hart, nowhere in sight for that matchup, nor was he mentioned, even though he was there for the later matchup on the card, involving the Hitman versus the Macho Man. So very interesting. Jimmy Hart, I told you guys, he'd still stick around, and he's here this week with Dangerous Danny up on the platform. And while the heels are out first, the George also introduces Sam Houston to the platform. And even Sam now has new music. some country western type stuff because you need music if you're going to be a dancing cowboy gimmick as Houston is indeed out in his cowboy costume or at least that's what it's supposed to be even does a little two-step up on the stage groan as Davis mocks Houston's costume his dancing and says he wasn't even impressed by Sam in the ring either Sam says it was quite the battle uh Sam that match lasted about a minute if i remember correctly and you got the win with Davis's foot 
under or on the rope or whatever it was. And as the promo continues on, it's very evident Sam Houston literally very clearly having issues trying to cut a promo here as Jimmy Hart even has to speak up asking Sam if the cat's got his tongue. Couldn't really hide it. Sam really stepping over his words as Houston admits to being nervous in front of thousands of fans, but it didn't stop him from whipping Davis's butt last time out. Davis then steps up to Sam, tells him to take his cowboy hat off in the building. Sam's response? He only takes his hat off for two reasons. One, when he's in his mama's house. And two, when he's in the company of a pretty lady. Lame. I'm really hoping somebody wrote this script and this wasn't coming from Sam himself. As dangerous Danny doesn't like that response, so he knocks the cowboy hat off of the head of Houston. Way to take initiative, Danny. But Houston gets steamed up and unloads on Davis as the two men go down, begin trading shots on the platform, rolling off the platform onto the arena floor before it's broken up by Blackjack Lanza and several officials. And Danny Davis, though, not backing down. He wants at Sam Houston. But Sam, he's hot too. And he wants right back at Dangerous Dan. Sam finally picking up his cowboy hat, dusting it off, and putting it back on his head, which actually gets a decent response. This is probably the loudest pop Houston has got since coming here to the WWF. And I don't know that this feud will do anything for either guy, but the pull-apart brawl was fun, even if they were relegated to the B-TV show for their feud. As Challenge rolls on, it's the Rock Don Morocco in the ring taking on Pete Sanchez. There's a name from the past. We get an insert promo here from Butch Reed. He says if Morocco wants to replace the superstar, he will go out the same way as Billy Graham. Lots of heels promising to end Babyface's careers as of late as the vascular Don Morocco riding his knee off the top rope into the face of Sanchez, riding him all the way down to the mat ugh, before the tombstone pile driver ends this one one minute and 28 seconds. And if you're expecting Graham to return to team with Morocco against Reed and the gang, don't hold your breath, guys. Superstar is, in fact, retired from the ring, at least as a wrestler. But it does look like Morocco will pick up in the Reed feud where the superstar left off. Is up next on Challenge. It's the Demolition music video. Doesn't get much cooler than that. And then from there, we see the replay of the Superstar Graham quote unquote announcement that we heard on Superstars. Not much coming from that. And then it's back to the ring tag team action Hart Foundation. Bret Hart, Jim Neidhart with manager Jimmy Hart in their corner, taking on Scott Casey and Sibiafi. As we get an insert promo this time from Strike Force, the tag team champions welcome a rematch against the former champs, so Strike Force not dodging the challengers. And while the baby faces try in this matchup, Neidhart gonna dominate early, catching an Afi crossbody and landing it into the Anvil Power Slam, just flattening him before Brett in with his patented backbreaker and a pile driver, and eventually it's the heart attack on CB Afi, gonna give the hearts the win. Three minutes and 17 seconds. And we close out Wrestling Challenge this week. Craig did George with another interview, a brand new up-and-coming tag team, at least for this week. It's the duo of the Birdman Coco Beware and the Junkyard Dog. Well, no doubt there are some very interesting World Wrestling Federation tag teams, but there is one that is really catching the World Wrestling Federation by storm these days. Frankie Beware, Coco Beware. And the Junkyard Dog, come on in. People are talking about oh, yeah. this very exciting tag team. you got some matches coming up, and I know you're excited about working together with the Junkyard Dog. That's right. I'm all excited because as long as I know I got the dog on my side, I don't have to worry about nothing. As long as I know I got Frankie on my shoulder, I don't have to worry about nothing. As long as I know I got the fans. I said the fans is really behind me, brother. I don't have to worry about nothing. Ain't that right, big dog? Come on, dog. Yeah. Yeah. Beware is quite a excited i know yeah, about this tag team as well it's an exciting oh, situation you know yeah. there's a lot of tag teams going throughout the world wrestling federation mm -hmm. and right now you know you got the strike force as the champion yeah. you got the islanders you got the, the hard foundation the you got the former champion you got two or three different combinations you got running through here but coco and i have the opportunity now to tag up for a little while and uh 
we're going to move right on down that road. Some of the other competitors that you may face, the Bolsheviks down the line, that's a, a young... And that's, that's a new team that just came in. Yeah. We've got the young stay, and that's a new upcoming team. Yes, they are. The thing we're trying to do now is build from the bottom and go to the top, and that's the thing we're looking out for right now, Coco and myself. And, of course, this is a new situation for you, being in a tag team division. You like that? Plus, I love it, brother, oh. because you see, when the world rests in face, when they start up to the mountaintop, me and Dog want to be climbing the mountaintop. We want to go to the promised land. We want to be with Hulk Hogan, brother. We want to be with the great ones that made it in the World Wrestling Federation. We want to be somebody. That's right. That's the reason why all the great talent is coming in right here in the World Wrestling Fe Federation. Because they want to be, I said they want to be somebody. You see, anybody just can't come here in the World Wrestling Federation. That's right. Anybody just say, say oh, can y'all come in and can y'all uh, put me together? No way, brother. You got to go over what you know. You got to be tough. You got to be somebody. That's the only way to get here, brother. And that's what Men Dog is all about, brother. I'll tell you something, Coco B. Well, I like the blend of this tag team. The blend is very important. The blend. You got law and order. Law and order. Uh, either order and law. Either way you got it. You got the boys. There you go, baby. You take the ring. You got to cry some All right, time. Coco B. Well, oh, yeah. and the jump shot dog and exciting oh. new tag team. So the dog and Coco, apparently a team now. Maybe for a few matches anyway. And as Challenge concludes, commentary on the matches here this week on Wrestling Challenge, all focused either on the upcoming Slammy Awards or Ted DiBiase wanting to buy the WWF title. So clearly the two biggest things right now for the WWF in December, one, their TV special, makes sense, and two, their major angle with the Million Dollar Man and Hulk Hogan. As we are off now to primetime wrestling for December 10th. So here it is, the December 10th edition primetime wrestling hosted by Gorilla Monsoon and a neck brace wearing Bobby the Brain Heenan as we go now to the intro of the program. I'm Gorilla Monsoon. I'm your host, Bobby the Brain Heenan. A little bit hoarse, aren't you? Hello, everyone, and welcome to primetime wrestling where we feature the superstars of the World Wrestling Federation and once again, neck brace born. It's amazing. A man 300 and some pounds has to take advantage of somebody that Stuck his nose where it didn't belong. Well, everybody knows I have a chronic injury of a bad neck, but no, they still have to keep... You have another chronic injury. You have a bad attitude. Yes, I do have a bad attitude. <laughs> a very bad attitude when it concerns Hulk Hogan. Well, for you folks out there who did not see Saturday night's main event and do not know what happened later on in the program, they we don't are, need to in know. fact, going to be showing them some of the footage that... That uh, was never cleared with me. What's well, too bad? <laughs> you, you weren't around. Too bad. You weren't around to clear any of that. I've been sitting right here for a half hour. They've been trying to get these cameras working. The squirrels died in the machine. Nothing <laughs> works here. <laughs> I can't believe it. So Bobby talking that chronic bad neck injury that he sustained started with Ken Patera. Well, it actually started in Japan, but that's another story. Started with Ken Patera earlier here this year, and now Hulk Hogan re-aggravating that injury. And Bobby did not clear the footage to re-air here on primetime, but. We see it again for the third time in these many days. Hulk Hogan taking his frustrations of losing to King Kong Bundy out on the brain. And while we're talking about injuries, we might as well bring up the injury to one Brutus, the barber beefcake. Bruti in a whole lot of trouble, possibly tearing some of those lateral collateral ligaments of the knee. You're in trouble as well. I'm. I'm uh... No one cheered when they helped me out of the ring, but they cheer when they help some misfit of society like Brutus, Brutus Beefcake out of the ring. And you're worried about his lateral collateral shock absorbers or wherever they are. <laughs> How about my neck? Does anybody care about me? Uh, yeah, I'm I care I'm about worried me. about you. You're spitting all over the set here. Is that maybe that's well, too it's hard tight. to talk? Hard well, to talk. It's hard to move around. Maybe that's too tight. It's cutting off the circulation of blood to the brain. The carotid arteries there play a. Very important. The arteries part. are not corroded. The Hulkster had his hands right around your beady little neck, yes, he didn't did. he? Three times. Three times. You didn't know enough to get out of there, did you? 
Maybe Brutus the Barber Beefcake, in fact, needs a manager. Uh, Jimmy Hart uh, played an awful important part in that match, in that double disqualification, and uh, maybe somewhere down the line, Brutus will be looking for some help. So, Gorilla, trying to talk about the recent attack, Greg Valentine on Brutus Beefcake, leading to that knee injury. It won't keep the barber out of the ring, but Monsoon bringing up that knee injury is Bobby Heenan. What about Bobby, guys? The focus should be on the brain. As Bobby Heenan says, his arteries are not corroded. That's carotid, Bobby. And you got to love the fun lines there with the lateral collateral and all that fun stuff. Bobby Heenan, nobody does it better. As we're off next to that clip, as promised, from Saturday night's main event. As Gorilla Monsoon tells Bobby, he got exactly what he deserved. Got exactly what you deserved. Jumped right in there, mm. grabbed a hold of the Hulkster by the leg. What did you expect? Not to be any retaliation of any kind? I'll tell you exactly why I grabbed his leg. His shoe was, was untied, right? No, it wasn't untied. I'm not going to make any excuses for what I did. I jumped and grabbed his leg. He was in the, He's about to step through those ropes and kick Bundy right in the teeth. So to prevent that, I grabbed the leg. Let's just he couldn't it. lose the match by being counted out. He could lose the match, but not the title. What would I gain by that? I wanted him in that ring. I didn't want him outside counted out, but I didn't want him to kick Bundy in the face. Picture That's why I stopped the leg. worth 10000 But th worth. did it justify what he did to me? Absolutely. Everybody knows I got a history of a bad neck. Well, you're going to have a bad neck But no, three time. times he squeezed almost the life out of me. Could have thrown me out, could have slammed me, could have knocked me out with a punch. No, he wanted to do permanent damage to me. He wanted to take me out of professional wrestling. I think he did. Fine. I think he did. And if he wants that kind of a war, then he's got that kind of a war. Not only that, you've got problems with the Million Dollar Man as well. In fact, we're going to bring you up to date right now on what that situation is. You won't like this either. Wait a minute. Virgil. Gorilla asking a simple question to Bobby Heenan here. What did you expect would happen after the involvement of Andre, after Bobby Heenan getting involved there? Bobby holding the foot of the champion, preventing him from getting back inside the ring, allowing Bundy to pick up the win on a countout, as Bobby said, he was simply trying to help his man, the challenger, King Kong Bundy. Hogan wanted to do permanent damage to his man. Bobby just couldn't allow it. You want a war, Hogan? You've got one. And up next, well, we heard him discuss it on Superstars. They continue to talk about it on Wrestling Challenge. So it only makes sense that the conversation continues on here on Primetime. I'm talking about the host discussing the million-dollar man wanting to purchase the WWF title. What a contemptuous individual. Stunned, aren't you? Shocked. Humiliated. I'm not quite sure what he means by that. You're not sure what he means? Would you, would you like me to explain it to you in your language so you could understand it? Yeah, please do. He's going to take some of his millions and approach the world's heavyweight champion, Hulk Hogan, and buy the World Wrestling Federation heavyweight championship from him. Is that clear enough? He, well, he can't do that. Well, what's to stop him from doing that? Well, there's got to be... I, I've is got there, people I manage that have worked too long and too hard and are in line for a championship of the world. Do you know for a fact that there's something in writing in the bylaws? There's got to be. Nobody can say you, you can't, can't buy a World Series, you can't buy a Super Bowl, and believe me, you can't buy a World Championship. You're positive of that? I'm not positive of it, no. You're not even sure what day of the week it is. I'm positive of one thing. I've got people in line for a championship match. I know you do. I've got people that I'm, I've worked all my life for. That may be just too bad. We'll be right back right after this. So there it is. Even Bobby Heenan doesn't like this idea. Million Dollar Man trying to purchase the belt. Great sell job here by Heenan. As even other heels clearly upset at DiBiase stealing their men's opportunity at the title. And as we close out this edition of Primetime, hey, how about a bonus promo, guys? Take it away, ravishing one. Yes, I'm talking about Rick Rude. Well, here on Prime Time, as you know, Gorilla Monsoon, I have confronted Bobby Heenan about the recent injury he sustained at the hands of heavyweight champ Hulk Hogan. Not that he didn't ask for it, because in my opinion, he did. Ravishing Rick Rude, maybe you can shed some light on it. I don't know if it's that old insurance scam again or if legitimately your manager, Bobby Heenan, is injured. Listen, little man, Bobby instructed me to talk about myself and not to talk about his business at this time. All right, let's talk about you, Ravishing Rick Rude. Certainly, you've got the World Wrestling Federation standing tall right now. You've got a number of opponents that uh, in the very near future you're going to be meeting. One name I want to bring up is that of Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, and I don't think it's any secret. Orndorff embarrassed you. He embarrassed your manager, Bobby Heenan, and I think right now that's where all of these bad feelings originate let's, from. Let's set the record straight. 
The Heenan family has embarrassed Paul Ohndorf. Bobby Heenan kicked Paul Ohndorf out of the family. And now I will embarrass Paul Ohndorf in the squared circle. Now, wait a minute. He did not kick yes, Paul Ohndorf out of the family. It happened yes, in front of a national did. television audience. Who are we trying to kid here? Paul Orndorff publicly fired Bobby the Brain Heenan as his manager. Why don't you tell the people the truth, little man? You knew ahead of time what was going down, and you buzzed Paul Orndorff. I am not a stooge. You knew ahead of time Paul was getting fired. We kicked him out. There was no room for Mr. Pitiful in the family. Well, I'll tell you what. Bobby Heenan, I think, brought it all on himself. He asked Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorf to come on out and stand by you and admit to you and the world that you have a better physique. And I don't know, that's only a matter of opinion anyway. If you want to ask the ladies of America who the sexiest man alive is, you'll come up with the answer, Ravishing. Well, it's not Pee Wee Herman, I can tell you that. I thank you. Ravishing Rick Rude. We're right back. All right, great stuff there from Ravishing Rick Rude. Going to be a major player moving forward here in the World Wrestling Federation as we move on to the following week. Superstars of Wrestling, December the 12th, taped November 17th, Des Moines, Iowa, Veterans Memorial Auditorium. Once again, Vince McMahon, Jesse Ventura, Bruno San Martino, all on commentary as we head to the ring for Demolition, Axe and Smash with manager Mr. Fuji taking on the duo of Jim Evans and Brady Boone. Hey, didn't they just recently take Boone out on a stretcher? Brave man here as we get an insert promo from Billy Jack Haynes and Kim Patera as they say their eyes are set on this match and Billy Jack's cousin Brady Boone going to watch out for him here this week. And honestly, again, surprised to see Boone back here already and not just back in action, but Back against the men who took him out, and he chooses Jim Evans as a partner? Where was Billy Jack Haynes for that contract? As Brady busts out a double handspring backflip into a drop kick early on in the matchup, and then another cute kick here from the former gymnast, because, yeah, that's what I'd do after last time, Brady. But Smash going to finally launch Boone into the air, dropping him right down on his gut before Jim Evans tagging in. Gets the beatdown of a lifetime here as it is demolished and destroyed. Evan's going to get the old masked superstar clothesline before the demolition decapitation puts Evans away two minutes and nine seconds. Now, post-match, demolition knocking Brady Boone out to the floor and then landing the decapitation finisher once more on Jim Evans. Brady, though, comes in to try and make the save, but gets eaten alive by Axe and Smash. Axe even tries to use Mr. Fuji's cane on Brady Boone. So finally, it is Ken Patera and Billy Jack Haynes out to make the save, and Haynes going to steal Fuji's cane, and the heels leave the ring. Wise move there. But interesting choice, demolition to feud with Billy Jack Haynes and Ken Patera, but it works because both men establish names, big names, big guys, and demolition well in control of this one. Is up next. It's a special interview. Craig to George up on the platform with Brutus the Barber Beefcake. We heard from the Hammer last week. As Beaver this week, he talks Valentine's attack with that figure four leg lock, nearly snapping his leg. The Barber stating it's a pain that he will never forget. And now he is a madman possessed. Brutite reminding the Hammer his leg is only bruised, not broken. Valentine may have won the battle a couple weeks ago, but he hasn't won the war. Unfinished business ahead, says Brutus Beefcake, as once again it's Slammy Awards promo time coming next week. And then back to the ring for Ravishing Rick Rude, who is indeed accompanied to the ring this week by his manager Bobby Heenan in a neck brace. It's Rick Rude taking on Mike Richards as Rude tells the half-wit heifers to keep the noise down so he can pose for the lovely ladies. And as the match gets going in between posing, it's a power slam, a snap suplex, and the body breaker going to give Rick Rude the win, one minute and 41 seconds. And post-match, Jesse Ventura shown stretching a Paul Orndorff action figure. But that's not all. The body also claiming that when he's done with Orndorff, he will make one arm smaller than the other. I wrote, wow, never caught that before. Damn, Jesse, that's rough. As we're off now, promo time, Mean Gene Oakland standing by with Jimmy Hart. And his heart foundation. All right, my guest at this time, not that long ago, was flying high. He was on cloud nine. Come on in the mouth of the South. Colonel Jimmy Hart. Welcome back, Jimmy Hart. No longer do you manage the tag team champions of the world. I'll grant you this. You do manage the current intercontinental heavyweight champ, the honky-tonk man. 
You've got the new tag team ladies champions, the Glamour Girls. So you're red hot right now, no doubt about it. You know what to say, baby, when you're on top, you gotta let it rock. Well, let me tell you, you think I'm gonna kick the Heart Foundation out? We were ripped off and we were robbed and here they are right now, baby. They made you a lot of money, Jimmy Hart, no doubt about that. You still, Jim the Anvil Knight Hart, contend you was robbed. Oh, that's good English. Yeah, I was robbed. I was robbed. I never said one peep. I never said submit. I never said a thing. Nothing. Not a thing. Nothing. Do you think a man of my caliber the play with the Dallas Cowboys, the Oakland Raiders, I was the best shot player in the world at 18, with a man of the back as big and strong as wide as mine? Do you think I'd give up on a little itty-bitty Boston crab from a little stupid puke? French Canadian! You think I'll do that? Settle down, you're out of control. Bret Hart, I want your thoughts. Let me put it this way. The closest the Anvil's ever come to a Boston crab is the guy that parks the cars at the Boston Garden. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? I understand that, sure. Now, the Boston crab, I mean, is that supposed to be a big threat to the Hart Foundation? <laughs> no! Because you're looking at the greatest technician in professional wrestling, and you're looking at the strongest man in professional wrestling linked together bound together with this man right here <laughs> and that's something the strike force doesn't have the strike force they they might be fairly quick and they, they might be fairly smart but there's one thing that they don't have they don't have a brain like this guy right here yeah let you me know ask, what i mean let me ask you a question gentlemen let me ask you a question you know something but i hope i never go bald and have to comb my hair from one side over the top like this guy does <laughs> to make it look like he's got hair <laughs> i don't have anything to comb over the top but thank you very much just gonna ask you if you guys were psychologically down since that defeat five weeks ago. But what apparently... do you think? Look at these guys. Look at these chests. Look at them. We're ready, oh, baby. The girls are still there, if that's what you mean. The girls are still there? They're still there, if that's what well, you mean. I've heard rumors to the contrary. I thank you, Jimmy Hart of the Hart Foundation. Oh, Stay tuned. We're about? right back. Oh, 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 so there it is. The Hart's still upset. The anvil, he never submitted. Same story every week. Brett gets his joke off this week, and at least Mean Gene gets it. But the Hart Foundation gunning for Strike Force and those WWF tag team titles as we're back to the ring for Hacksaw Jim Duggan taking on Pete Sanchez as Duggan's still rocking that theme music that he's had now for about a couple months, I think. As early on, Jesse Ventura asking a question in the matchup. Why does Duggan ho so much in the ring? And well, let's listen. Sanchez whipped to the ropes and off. Elbow knocks him down. Oh, what a close line. Why does this guy howl when he's in the ring? I don't know why he does a lot of things, Jesse. He's just a little different, okay? You different. can accept being different, can't you? Different. In other words, he's maybe a little, how do we say, mentally retarded? No. Is that the way you no, put it? I would say eccentric. eccentric. You're different. You're eccentric. Why don't you ask him, Jess? Why don't you ask him if he's a little retarded? Ooh, no, because I really don't think I'd get an answer from him. The guy's not capable of talking, I don't You think. might get an answer with a two-by-four. You'd like that, wouldn't you, Bruno? Well, let's say I wouldn't shed no tears. So Vince, Bruno, stating that Hacksaw Duggan, he's just different, Jess. What's that supposed to mean? He's mentally retarded? And you gotta love Bruno there. Why don't you go ask him if he's a little retarded, Jess? I wrote, LOL, what the fuck are we doing here, guys? What is he, retarded? Unbelievable. As there's lots of hoeing by the fans as well in this matchup, Duggan in full control throughout Wind up body slam into the three point stance and clothesline gives Hacksaw the win. Two minutes and 11 seconds. And we're off again once more. Another promo lined up. This is a fun one here. Mean Gene Oakland standing by with the macho man, Randy Savage. All right. Happy holidays from all of us in the World Wrestling Federation. Macho man, Randy Savage, Sarasota, Florida. If we can kind of recap 1987, I'd like to bring you in. So much happened to you this calendar year, and so much still happening, and I don't even yeah. want to venture a guess on what might be happening down the road in 1988 for you. And, of course, I've got to include your lovely manager, Elizabeth. Oh, yeah, crystal ball tells it all. Possibly, maybe, but the 87 is not done yet. And they're right. Possibly. Absolutely. Okay, that's right. You don't need to carry around a calendar to keep up with the months, the days, the minutes, the seconds. Yeah. Uh huh. And what's on everybody's mind nowadays? Do I detect yeah. that you have unfinished business to conclude? Absolutely, positively. Yeah. Thinking about you, honky tonk man, and your intercontinental heavyweight championship belt. But more important than that is that attitude that you have. Yeah. And remembering, possibly, maybe Hershey Park, Pennsylvania. 
When you pushed Elizabeth down real, real, real hard, yeah, you got, uh, yeah, satisfaction, yeah. And now I'm worried about my satisfaction. And Elizabeth's satisfaction, when I take you and take that guitar and wrap it around your neck, take the belt away from you, possibly strip you naked there right in the middle of the ring, and then everybody laughing at the honky-tonk man, yeah, laughing out loud, yeah. And then thank everybody at the end of the, uh, <laughs> fiasco. You are the fiasco. I'm telling you something. I'm gonna be your shadow, yeah. I'm gonna follow you to the slammies. I'm gonna follow you everywhere the Pile Driver album plays, yeah. I'm thinking, 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 thinking that I'm gonna be around all the time. What about this jum... In fact, I'm around right now. Gum-chewing manager, this, uh... Jimmy Hart, what do you make of him? Jimmy Hart, the mouth of the South. The yeah. Colonel. Mm-hmm. What I'm thinking about you, yeah, is that the Colonel, yeah, you're going to get on a different bandwagon, yeah, because the honky-tonk man is going to be yesterday's newspaper, just like when 87 goes by. And I'm thinking 88 is going to be a real, real, real good year for the macho man Randy Savage, yeah. And the end of the line for you, honky-tonk man, and you, mouth of the South. Hey, I'm history. I'm All cool. right, I yeah. Thank you. And I'm going that Macho way. Man yeah. Randy Savage. Macho Man vowing to strip the Honky Tonk Man of the IC title and maybe strip him naked at the same time. Yeah, everybody laughing at the Honky Tonk Man. I like it. Aha. Macho Madness running wild. Up next, Caesars Palace Slammy's promo, guys. That's right, Caesars Palace. That's Caesars in Atlantic City, New Jersey, not Las Vegas. And then back to the ring, Greg the Hammer Valentine, Jimmy Hart in his corner, taking on Scott Casey here. As we see a crossbody early on from the Cowboy, Scott Casey gets him a two count. And again, Casey dropping the hammer after a series of shots. Valentine, though, catches Casey with an elbow to the head and in control as he begins to work over the Cowboy's leg. Valentine also going to deliver a shoulder breaker here, get himself a two count. Casey comes fighting back one more time, though, but misses a knee in the corner, further injuring his leg and an elbow drop from the hammer. Lays Casey out, allowing Valentine to lock in that figure four and pick up the submission win, three minutes and 32 seconds. And I don't know what went wrong here, but these guys had all sorts of sloppy spots in this one. Valentine and Casey, both guys consummate professionals. They've been around forever. Both guys know what they're doing, and it just didn't work out here. But for now, we're off to update. And Craig to George. Craig keeping us abreast of the Million Dollar Man situation as he continues to offer to purchase the WWF title. From the pages of the World Wrestling Federation magazine, here's Update with Craig DeGeorge. Hello, everyone. The holiday season is here, and Ted DiBiase, the Million Dollar Man, is in a spending mood, and I mean spending. In fact, we may have the ultimate test of DiBiase's belief that everybody has a price. You know what I'm talking about. Just two weeks ago, the Billion Dollar Man said that he would buy the World Wrestling Federation Heavyweight Championship, that he would buy Hulk Hogan. Now, certainly, Ted DiBiase has enough wealth to tempt just about anyone, but whether it will be enough to lure the Hulkster, if there is indeed a price, remains to be seen. The World Wrestling Federation Heavyweight Champion told me he will make a public announcement on this next week. However, due to the immediacy of this, we are going to try and get a word with the Hulkster. Now, he's expected to be making his way out of that locker room any moment, and perhaps we'll get an update on what is becoming a very peculiar situation. I said, Hulk Hogan! Hey, wait a minute, man. This is the same question everybody's been asking me. It's like the whole world. I mean, everybody's been asking me, and I told everybody, I including you, that I'd give you an answer next week. Can you ask me to make a proposal to you to buy the belt? Oh, yeah, man, he, he made a proposal. Yeah, he approached me, but it's the way he did it, man. He approached each and every single family member of mine, laid out the high seven-digit rap, man, from a modest family, a modest background. They couldn't comprehend it. The pressure he put on each and every family member and me, man, is unbelievable. I just can't handle the pressure right now. Well, with that kind of pressure, I guess you could surmise that the possibility exists that Hulk Hogan could sell out. Whoa, the possibility whoa, whoa, indeed whoa, whoa, is... Wait a minute, are, are you trying to talk for me, man? Just saying the, pos- the possibilities are... Is possibility, there. possibility. Let me tell you something. I told you, I told everybody, I'd make an announcement next week. I'd make a public announcement next week, man, in the decision I make, the figures he quoted, the decision I make, whatever it is, it'll be one that I won't regret. Mm. Throughout his fabulous reign, we have never seen the champion endure this much pressure. 
And so next week, we will get his decision. Who knows at this point, although we can be sure of one thing, no matter what happens, as Hoke said, yes or no, his action will be one he will never regret. With Update, I'm Craig DeGeorge. So there you hear it. Hulk Hogan promised to make a public response next week. But Craig, he wanted to try to catch the Hulkster right now, get a jump on it. Craig's standing out in the hallway right by the Hulkster's locker room. As Hogan comes out flanked by Blackjack Lanza, and hey, it's Tim White in a suit, no less. Hulkster, though, stops to talk to Craig. He says, everybody's been asking, man. Everybody wants to know. And Hulk said he will address everyone next week. Did DiBiase make an offer? Yes, he did. Hulk confirms, in the high seven figures, dude. And Hulk's friends, his family, they can't comprehend the offer, nor can they comprehend Hulk having to contemplate on it. It's heavy pressure, brother. But everyone, including Ted DiBiase, will get a response next week. As Hulk Hogan begins to walk away, Craig and George questions the possibility, did Hulk Hogan sell out? Thus causing Hogan to storm back at the mere mention of that, How dare you, Craig? As I guess we'll just have to wait and see next week. The story continues. As we're off to a quick bumper promo here, plugging the Slammy Awards, Honky Tonk Man says he's going to be the man to win the best video at the Slammy Awards. And as a reminder, we are treated to the Honky Tonk Man music video. Before it's back to the ring, one man gang standing in there with the Doctor of Style Slick taking on Sonny Rogers here. And the gang doesn't even bother to remove his jean vest for this one, just mauls Rogers from the bell. And there it is, the Gord Buster, the Master Blaster, the Slick brought up in a recent promo, and I guess we're back to that move again, for these set of tapings anyway, as the gang going to score the victory, 1 minute and 18 seconds. And up next, we just heard Hulk Hogan talk about the offer laid out to him by the Million Dollar Man to buy that WWF title. Well, now it's the manager's turn. To speak out, I'm talking about all of the managers, well, most of the managers here in the World Wrestling Federation. It's not fair. I know that DiBiase's got enough money to buy the World Wrestling Federation Heavyweight Championship. And I know that Hulk Hogan, I know he's going to sell out. But before he sells out, I am demanding that Greg the Hammer Valentine and the Honky Tonk Man have a shot for that World Heavyweight Championship belt. It's just not fair. It's just not fair. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not right and it's not fair. I'm talking about that no good Ted DiBiase with all that money. The man is trying to buy the World Wrestling Federation Heavyweight Championship. Well, you know, I want the one-man game. I want the natural butchery, yeah, to go out and earn it because, hey, like the slickster says, honest is the best policy. Yeah. <laughs> DBS sound. You like green, huh? Lots of green. But also Mr. Fuji, he like green too from Killer Khan's mouth. The greenness because we will get to championship before you, boy song. <laughs> I realize that Ted DiBiase, the Million Dollar Man, says that everybody has their price. But in the case of the World Wrestling Federation Heavyweight Championship, I hope and I pray it's not true. There you hear it from several of the managers here. Jimmy Hart says it's not fair. DiBiase buying the WWF title. Jimmy knows that Hulk Hogan will sell out, but demands that Honky Tonk Man and Greg Valentine get title shots first. We also hear from the Doctor of Style Slick once again. Says that no good Ted DiBiase with all his money going to buy the WWF title. Slick wanting Reed and the gang to get title shots because they earned those shots. After all, honesty is the best policy. (laughs) Then from there, we even hear from Mr. Fuji, the devious one. He says DiBiase likes green, but Fuji, he too likes the green. The green mist of one killer Khan. Wow, that's dated. Khan already gone from the company, but... I did like the line there from Fuge. Even Oliver Humperdinck says he knows Ted DiBiase says everybody has a price, but Oliver hoping that it isn't true. Then it's back to the ring for action with the ultimate warrior taking on Dusty Wolf here. And the warrior does have that classic theme music now. We talked about that last time here on this show. And he even does the rope shake as he enters the ring, but doesn't run to the ring yet. 
Still, that doesn't stop Dusty from getting out of Warrior's way, and I don't blame him. Dusty, though, attacks the Warrior at the bell, but gets launched across the ring and a big clothesline across the face from the Warrior before we get the Gorilla Press drop and the Ultimate Warrior scoring the win in just 1 minute and 20 seconds. Lots of quick matches here this week, making room for an added match as we head back to the ring once more. Tag team action with the Islanders, Haku and Tama taking on Jerry Allen and Jim Parks, and yes, Bobby Heenan in the corner of his Islanders here who dominate the action and put Parks away in quick fashion as Tama goes up top, delivering that flying splash, giving the Islanders the win, just one minute and 29 seconds. And hey, how about that? We just saw the Islanders in action. Call it coincidence if you want to, because I do believe there's going to be a feud of Bruin here very soon with this team. It's Mean Gene Oakland standing by with the British Bulldogs. Boy, Matilda, you are a prize. What did you just tell me before we went on the air? Oh, please give me a break. Dog, a little too friendly for me. Matilda, I like you. You're a good old scout, sweetheart. She was telling me earlier on she wanted to bring in the man that she's mascot for. Come on in, Davy Boy Smith, Dynamite Kid, the British Bulldogs, and gentlemen. I'll tell you what, that Matilda's a little fresh, but uh, she's got good reason to be excited. Right now, you're working your way back up at the World Wrestling Federation, David. That's right, Mean Gene. Matilda's been traveling all over the United States. The British Bulldogs have been traveling all over the United States to face all the World Wrestling Federation tag teams. We're trying to get back and work our way to the top of that ladder, Mean Gene. We want the Hart Foundation. We want the Bolsheviks. We want the demolition. And we want to work our way to the top and face the strike force. And Matilda wants to see it, and the British Bulldogs are going to do it. All right, a lot of teams right now. I guess we can talk about Dynamite. You've got the Islanders, Haku and Tama. They've been very impressive as of late. And the newest edition of the World Wrestling Federation, the Bolsheviks. I'm talking about Nikolai Volkov and, of course, his partner, Boris Zukov. That's right, you know what I mean, Gene. You know, Boris Zukov has been with Nikolai Volkov for a very short time. And he's already got himself a very big head in the Wrestling Federation. But the thing is, Russians, we're ready for you anytime. We'll use you as stepping stones. Demolition, they're strong, aggressive, very good team, Mean Gene. But Matilda told us this morning, don't worry about the demolition. Don't worry about the strike force. We're coming up later. Strike force, we're coming for those belts. But first of all, we've got to beat people like the Russians, the demolition, the Islanders. Matilda said, don't worry about nothing, kid. Smith, we're going all the way, and we're going to take those belts, Mean Gene. You know, I can't ever recall Davy Boy Smith ever seen so many great tag teams in the World Wrestling Federation. Can you? Well, me and Gene, there's a lot of great tag teams in the World Wrestling Federation, and there's a lot of big tag teams, but they've all got managers, and we've got Matilda, and everybody knows what Matilda did to Slick, what she did to Jimmy Hart. So all you managers out there, you beware. Don't even think about jumping the British Bulldogs from behind, because Matilda is going to be there no matter where it is. She's going to be with the British Bulldogs. I don't mind telling you, my kind of girl, Matilda, the mascot for the British Bulldogs. They are the Dynamite Kid, Davy Boy Smith, a couple of the very best in the World Wrestling Federation today. We're right back. So there was Davy Boy Smith, Dynamite Kid, Matilda in full effect here, up on a pedestal, literally, for this promo here. Managers beware, Matilda in the house. As Superstars concludes, we learn next week, it's the premiere of the music video, If You Only Knew. Featuring all of the WWF superstars, we're also going to see highlights of the upcoming Danny Davis-Sam Houston matchup, the rematch, upcoming next on Wrestling Challenge. Plus, don't forget guys, Hulk Hogan promised to answer the offer of the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. So a big episode headed our way next week. As we are off to Wrestling Challenge for December 13th, tape back November 18th, Omaha, Nebraska, Civic Auditorium. Bobby Heenan, Gorilla Monsoon on commentary, and straight away, it's off to the ring for Bam Bam Bigelow. Oliver Humperdinck in his corner. Bammer taking on Brian Costello here, and Bigelow in full control of the matchup. Nice savat kick by the big man. As Gorilla says Bigelow, he plays a mean sax. Pipping the Slammy Awards, Bigelow will be playing a big brass instrument, or at least pretending to. As in the ring here, Bigelow with a big press slam, slingshot splash, ending Costello's night. Two minutes and 22 seconds. We even get a nice little cartwheel after the matchup for good measure by the Bammer. And then it's off to special report as we get a recap of the Dream Team feud going all the way back to that WrestleMania 3 split. And of course, their recent issues on TV as well. Then to the ring for the Bolsheviks. Nikolai Volkov, Boris Zukov, accompanied by manager Slick, 
taking on Jim Evans and Brady Boone. Brady, didn't you learn anything from last time? Teaming with Jim Evans once again. We'll get an insert promo here from the Doctor of Style Slick. He's pumped for the Slammy Awards as he plans to win Song of the Year with Jive Soul Bro. I'll buy that, Slickster. And then from there, it's back to the ring for more singing. Nikolai Volkov and the Russian National Anthem. And as the action gets going, Brady Boone catching Nikolai off guard with a dropkick early on, but he can't drop the big Russian. Volkov retaliating with a nasty clothesline that Boone sells by taking a backflip bump. Nice spot. Evans then tagged in, and he too gets dominated as Volkov busts out a gut-rich suplex, not once, but twice. And then Volkov with a, well, a fucked up looking belly to belly before Zukov back in tries to do the old Uncle Ivan Koloff move, that riding knee off the top rope, riding the back of his opponent's head down into the mat. But Evans seems confused, doesn't know how to take the spot and fairly sloppy finish here. Nevertheless, Boris Zukov making the cover, Bolsheviks picking up the win, two minutes and 43 seconds. As we are off now to Mean Gene Oakland standing by with Mr. Fuji and his demolition. I don't think it's any big secret here in the World Wrestling Federation, Mr. Fuji known to push his men so hard, some to the point of breaking. As a matter of fact, many of his men become so mentally desiccated, like that, that uh, they're not able to function as normal members in society anymore. Mr. Fuji, no doubt about it, a great manager, your track record speaks for itself. Very true. Let me tell you, fan. Basic training is over! Now, the demolition are ready for the combat zone. And we want that belt, and we will get the belt. I'm very curious, Smash uh, Hacks, what uh, Mr. Fuji puts you through during the course of a work week. Well, we've swam across Lake Erie. We've swam up streams. We've climbed the tallest buildings. And like Master Fuji says, we are ready. If you look at Master Fuji, he's got a little smile on his face. When he gets that smile, that means he placed an order. He placed an order with Axe, and he placed it with Smash. And that order is to go to the top, which we are to the top. And that means those belts. That means that strike force. Those are going to be ours. Wait a minute. Stand in line, gentlemen. I think there's a couple of other men you're going to have to meet to get the strike force. Axe, you know I'm talking about Ken Patera. And you Ken know Jack. something, Howard? Uh, We've reached almost every goal that Master Fuji set. When he took us under his wing, he put down on the blackboard. I want 127 people put in the hospital. We did it. I want 27 legs broken. We did it. I want 31 arms broken. We did it. I want this guy put out, that guy put out. Ken Pater and Billy Jack Haynes are going to be next. And I'll tell you what, Master Fuji and Demolition want the Tag Team Championship belts. Master Fuji wants it. We're going to give it to him. Oh, very good. You got some kind of a deal worked out with Blue Cross, Mr. Fuji? Very good, yes, yes, yes. Keep talking to my man, Dave. I don't mind talking to him. They've got the numbers down, 127. 127. It would have been 128, but the one guy, we kicked him under the ring and I couldn't find him. Very good. I thank you, Axe and Spash from Demolition. Awesome. The only way to describe these two men. And, of course, they're managed by Mr. Fuji. Awesome. So Mr. Fuji setting goals and demolition, destroying them. I guess you could say they're demolishing them. There's been 127 victims thus far. There would be 128, but they couldn't find the other fellow. Kicked him under the ring, still can't seem to locate him. Axe was always a great promo. Smash was awesome too. Demolition, just next level awesome, guys. And if we haven't been reminded enough, don't worry, guys, it's only a week away. The Slammy Awards coming December 19th as is being dubbed a night of hams and a night of slams. Yes, the Slammy Awards. Next week here on The Grenade. It's the Slammy Awards. Television's premier sports entertainment awards show. More ostentatious than the Oscars. More elaborate than the Emmys. The Slammys promises to be a night of hams and a night of slams. Join Hulk Hogan and all the gang. For television Slammy Awards. And then we're off to the ring for the rematch of the century. Okay, I wouldn't go that far. It's not even the rematch of the week. It's Sam Houston taking on Dangerous Danny Davis. Jimmy Hart in his corner. And you know how important this match is, guys? We get an insert promo from Mr. Fuji 
who wants to talk about Ted DiBiase trying to buy the WWF title. Fuji not happy. That has absolutely nothing to do with this revenge match. Just to give you an idea of how important it is here on the B show, as Danny Davis going to try and get the first blow, but Sam Houston ready and unloads as he enters the ring. The brawl, though, quickly spills outside as the two men are entangled and continue their battle back inside the ring as they clearly have picked up right where they left off during that promo last week. Sam still wearing his chaps here as the brawl continues on. They roll back outside the ring a second time and can't seem to be separated as referee Dave Hebner having no luck with these two and the fight going to spill back to the floor even a third time in and out of the ring. Now, I know this sounds awesome and intense, guys, but between Houston wearing red, white, and blue chaps and Danny Davis just seemingly rolling around all over the place, not actually trying to fight Sam Houston, this is really borderline embarrassing. And so after re-entering the ring again, believe it or not, they roll out of the ring a fourth time after some awful-looking riding and sit-out wrestling-type countering. And finally, after they spill out of the ring an insane fifth time, Sam Houston accidentally catching Dave Hebner with an elbow, putting the referee down long enough for Jimmy Hart to try and interfere. But Houston, he sees Jimmy coming. But what Sam doesn't see is that Hart has now given Danny Davis the megaphone. And Dangerous Danny blasting Sam in the back before the former referee rolling back inside Jimmy Hart aiding Dave Hebner up and into the ring as Hebner begins to make the count. And yes, it is Sam Houston laid out with the megaphone. Houston counted out of the ring, out cold on the floor. Danny Davis picking up the win. This whole thing went four minutes and two seconds, about three and a half minutes too long, if you ask me. Post-match, Sam Houston recovering, rolling back inside, looking for revenge. The two men again trade blows, as I seem to notice that Davis's punches look weaker than I've ever seen. Danny barely getting over for a hip toss as well before he bails from the ring. Not sure what's up with Davis here. We know that he suffered a knee injury around this time. He, he worked the Survivor Series match, didn't do a whole lot in that as well. And then Danny missing a few weeks after Survivor Series on the house shows trying to rehab that leg. So I'm not sure if that played a part in all of this or not, but not a pretty matchup at all. And even though Sam Houston lost, just like Hogan must pose, Houston must dance. So we get a little two-step action here. To end this abortion of a segment, I wrote, Dear God, this was clearly designed for a rubber match for the house shows. We know Houston got the first win. Davis cheated for this countout victory here, but this did not make me want to see a third one. And I, you guys have been listening to this show. You know I've been putting Davis's heel heat over, at least earlier in the year, and wanting them to do a little more with him. And I think Danny showed that he, he had potential in the ring as well, even going back to Mr. X. And Sam Houston, I was always a fan and Crockett, and the UWF, but it just wasn't translating over here to the World Wrestling Federation. You could blame his size. Yeah, he had the height, but skinny as a beanpole at this point in his career with Sam Houston still. Just didn't work in the land of the Giants, but still could have been believable maybe if he hadn't been given that awful character. And the end result, this matchup, if you want to call it one, it was like the blind leading the blind out there, just not very good at all. As we are off now to Mean Gene Oakland standing by once again, Jimmy Hart, man, he's been busy these last couple weeks here. On the sound bites, Jimmy Hart standing by this time with the greatest intercontinental champion of all time. Don't tell Gunther I said that. Here he is, the Hockey Talk Man. All right, stay tuned. More exciting action coming up here in just a moment or two. Jimmy Hart, I'm going to prevail upon you, sir. Come on. What in the world? I can't believe that. First of all, congratulations on you being able to hook up in one fashion or another with Greg the Hammer Valentine. That is quite a coup indeed. You better believe it. Greg the Hammer Valentine he is a superstar, baby, in the WWF. You forget about the Glamour Girls, Dangerous Danny Davis, the Heart Foundation, and the hey, greatest... Hey, hey. What, what, what? Tell me more about the Glamour Girls. Oh, they're gorgeous. They're beautiful. And they are the ladies' tag team champions. But let's bring in the Intercontinental Champion, the greatest all of all time, baby. The greatest Intercontinental Heavyweight Champion of all time, Jimmy Hart. That's thank the way. You, thank you, you like thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jimmy. You're a beautiful audience. Thank you. Thank you for your respect, Gene. Thank you for being able to recognize the greatest Intercontinental Heavyweight Champion of all time. I say line them up like the honky-tonk man. <clears throat> Knock them down. <laughs> like Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. Maybe like the honky-tonk man, huh? Mm, mm, mm. Macho man Randy Savage. What in the world are you trying to do? Why do you keep signing for these matches? Why? <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you something, Macho Man. I want you to listen real good. See, my girlfriend Peggy Sue, she's getting all upset. 
She don't like what's been happening. She don't like the way Elizabeth's been looking at the honky-tonk. She don't like the way Elizabeth's been wanting to get in the ring and caress me, touch me. Whoa, 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 whoa Whisper in my, run her fingers through my hair. Do what? Mm-hmm. My girlfriend's getting real upset. You know, I told you if you didn't get her name right, she's going to take her bobby socks and shove them down your throat. I said Peggy Sue. Mm-hmm. Said that all along. You got it right now. Now we got to get Macho Man's mind just right. And I think I know how to do it. So you're looking at the total entertainment package. I can sing. I can dance. <laughs> I can play the guitar. Well, you're brutal on that guitar. And I'm going to do something nobody else has ever done. I'm going to do something for Macho Man that nobody has ever what, done. What, what's that? I'm going to shake, rattle, and roll Elizabeth. <laughs> good, good. Well, thank you very much, Jimmy Hart, and a reigning intercontinental heavyweight champ, the Honky Tonk Man. So Jimmy Hart, he has the ladies' tag team champion still, Leilani Kai, Judy Martin, the Glamour Girls, and he also has the greatest IC champ in the Honky Tonk Man. And of course, Honky now has Peggy Sue by his side as well. Once again, teasing, putting the shake, rattle, and roll on the lovely Elizabeth. And then it's back to the ring tag team action with the tag team champion Strike Force taking on Steve Lombardi and Dusty Wolf as we get an insert promo once again from the Hart Foundation who simply want those tag team titles back. I think they've made it clear as Bobby Heenan has coined the term La Bamba and Lucky Pierre when he references Tito Santana and Rick Martel. So we're in that moment now, guys. I always got to chuckle out of that line. Of course, La Bamba being Tito, Lucky Pierre, I don't know how he got the name, talking about Rick Martel. As Bobby Heenan points out that they have a hockey puck and a sombrero on their jackets. The sombrero, I remember. The hockey puck? Not so much. I gotta go check that out. As it is, Lucky Pierre, or Rick Martel, looking good early on here. And then it's La Bamba's turn. Sorry, Tito Santana in control. Match ends with the Martel Boston Crab on Dusty Wolf, giving Strike Force the win. Three minutes and 31 seconds is up next. Special interview. Craig DeGeorge up on the platform. Ted DiBiase, along with Virgil. The Million Dollar Man shows off the cover of the brand new WWF magazine, the one in which he bought himself. Yes, he paid to put his likeness on the cover. As DiBiase once again reiterates, he is going to purchase the WWF title from the current champion Hulk Hogan. DiBiase asking, have you seen the pressure that's been put on the champion? Should he take the offer? DiBiase says that Hulk Hogan's price was high, but everybody does indeed have a price. Ted promising that once he's bought that WWF title, he will be the first million-dollar champion. Well, he's got some of that right anyway. As it's back to the ring for Dino Bravo, the Canadian strongman with Frenchie Martin in his corner, Dino taking on leaping Lanny Poffo. Is we get an insert promo here from Frenchie Martin? He asks, why did Dino choose Frenchie as his manager? Because Dino is intelligent enough to know that Frenchie knows it all. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Not the greatest promo ever, but it'll have to make do. As Lanny Poffo also has a poem time for us all. Yes, indeed, it's poem time. As Lanny states that Dino Bravo, he once had the fans, but perhaps the peroxide in his hair bleached his brain. As the action gets going, Dino controls gut wrench suplex, side suplex, and a folding back suplex, giving Bravo the win. Two minutes and one second. Dino Bravo may not be the most over character right now in the WWF but anything's better than the new dream team. I wish both Valentine and Bravo the best of luck in their careers as we continue on into 1988. But right now we're going to continue on with challenge. Craig did George interviewing Coco beware about the Slammy awards. Coco says he's going to sing the pile driver song live at the event. Looking forward to that one, Coco. And speaking of the Birdman, we head back to the ring. We heard a promo from him last week. Well, we're going to get one match from him here this week. I think it's their only televised match as a quote-unquote tag team, talking about Coco Beware teaming with the Junkyard Dog, taking on the duo of Terry Gibbs and Barry Horowitz, the Florida Express, if you will. And with this being a throwaway match, we get an insert promo from Jimmy Hart claiming that the Honky Tonk Man will win it all at the Slammy Awards. And as you guys might guess here in the action, it's headbutts from the dog, drop kicks from Beware, Barry going to eat the thump power slam, Gibbs rushing in to make the save, but he takes a headbutt as well. And then Coco tagged in, landing the Ghostbuster on Barry Horowitz. The Birdman and the Dog secure the win in just two minutes' time. And as we close out Wrestling Challenge here this week, Mean Gene Oakland standing by one final time this week. 
He's going to talk to Bobby the Brain Heenan and Ravishing Rick Rude. If there's one man in the World Wrestling Federation, kind of hurts me to give him credit. It's Bobby the Brain Heenan, but Bobby Heenan, I must say, has got to be given the credit. He is responsible in part for the tremendous success that is being enjoyed right now by this band from Robbinsdale, Minnesota, just outside of the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Ravishing Rick Rude. So much happening for you as of late in the World Wrestling Federation, Mr. Rude. That's right. We got one goal in mind, and he's called Hulk Hogan. And everybody else on the way is just another rung in the ladder. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're talking about Mr. Wonderful being a stepping stone, I know that recently you have signed contracts to meet him. I think Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff is more than just a stepping stone for you to get to Hulk Hogan. Oh, no doubt that Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff is more than just a stepping stone. You don't have to stand here and tell anybody that because everybody knows what kind of man Mr. Wonderful is. But he's not nearly the man is ravishing Rick Rude. And there is no man in the WWF who can compare with my simply ravishing body. Well, I, I will give you credit for this. You do have a phenomenal physique, and I'm sure that it's something you had to work long and hard to, uh, to attain. But, you know, professional wrestling is more than having a great body. Mr. Root, I don't think I have to point that out to you. I don't think so either, because the fact of the matter is I meet all comers. I fight anybody as sexy as I am. When I get into the ring, I lose all regard for myself or for anything else as far as that goes. You know, I've got a couple of uh, negative uh, letters, more than a couple. I've got a, geez, a mail room full of them. Apparently, you're breaking up a few homes around the country, from what I understand. That's right. I guess the ladies have a new nickname for me. They call me The Gift. The Gift? The Gift. I wouldn't have thought to all the names they could pick, they would call you The Gift. That's because you're not a lady. All right. Well, apparently, the ladies do have quite an eye for you. Ravishing Rick Rude, his manager, Bobby Heenan, sideline for the time being, but don't worry, he is still behind the scenes, manipulating as he always is, and certainly he has got goals for this man. Like heavyweight champion of the world, Hulk Hogan, it's a good possibility. I thank you, Ravishing Rick Rude, and fans, stay tuned, we're going to be right back. So once again, the heels reiterating Mr. Wonderful, he doesn't compare to one Ravishing Rick, Gene having some fun with Rude here, as Rick, he was able to fire back, quick-witted, everybody all around here in this promo. Fun stuff here as Rick Root continues to climb the ladder. As we're off to one final piece of business here this week, talking about primetime wrestling for December the 14th. Hey, wait a minute. We just had an episode on the 10th, Ray. Well, that's true. This is a special Monday night edition hosted by Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan. Sadly, no exclusive matches here this week. Also, not a lot of sound bites to be had here this week on primetime. Now, the duo never phoned it in. It's always a fun time, but nothing really soundbite worthy, if you will, other than this one piece of business coming out of a matchup featuring Bam Bam Bigelow scoring a win over the evil Mongolian Killer Khan. Well, we know Killer Khan's already gone from the company, which is probably why we're going to see some of these matches air here over the next several weeks on primetime. Khan doing some jobs to some of the bigger names, like a Macho Man Savage. But here he is doing a job to Bam Bam Bigelow. And as we come back out, we know Khan's already gone, abruptly retiring from the business. Bobby Heenan was never really a fan to begin with. And here is the brain putting the verbal boots to the Mongolian. Bam Bam is something else, is he not? <clears throat> lucky, Mr. Lucky. Lucky? Yes, lucky. Beat the guy right in the middle of the ring with a big splash. How is that lucky? He was just lucky, though. Khan had him on points. But Khan's not that good either. Khan is really a ham and egger, if you come Let to think of it. write that down, Mr. Right Fuji will be interested to know that you made that derogatory remark about his man. Egger. Egger. Yeah. Ham and Egger. Obviously Bam Bam you, didn't really beat anybody. He beat some guy that should have been in a prelim match anyway. He could do the same thing to King Kong Bundy with Are that big splash. Are you kidding? Absolutely. I'm not kidding. Bundy hit him so hard he changed his zip code. See, you're not, you're not talking straight brain, brain because I know that you're all excited about the Slammies. You're all excited about Mr. DiBiase and what he's doing here in the World Wrestling Federation. trying to enjoy the Slammies. So there it is, Bobby Heenan, not really impressed that Bam Bam beat Killer Khan because Khan, he's just a ham and egger, a prelim guy, says Bobby Heenan. Wow. Talk about some shots. Bobby Heenan just did not care. But that's going to wrap it up here this week for the Grenade Guys. Had a lot of fun in and out this week. Show really flowed, and that means with this episode down, we only have one more episode to go 
for the 1987 in the World Wrestling Federation project. Yes, the final two weeks of WWF TV, including a quick look at the Slammy Awards. So stand back for that one, guys. So yes, indeed, we are all out of time this week, or at least all out of notes. Two weeks of December in the books, two more to go, and then it's off to 1988. And you guys, I know you're waiting for it. The big selling point of next week's episode of The Grenade, will Hulk Hogan sell out to the Million Dollar Man? Will he sell the WWF title to Ted DiBiase? Just a week away from finding out, guys. Either that or just jump onto Google if you don't already know the answer. But I encourage you to wait. We'll hear it from the horse's mouth himself. Yes, I'll have the soundbite, guys. The very famous soundbite of Hulk Hogan's response. Here next week on The Grenade, going to be a fun time, guys, in 1988. Oh, right around the corner. The very first Royal Rumble, the very first SummerSlam. Survivor Series going to return to the Richfield Coliseum. Of course, WrestleMania 4. Multiple Saturday night's main events. The Mega Powers going to start their epic run as a tag team. We'll see a new WWF champion. Will it be Ted DiBiase? Just wait and see, guys. All that coming very soon here on The Grenade when we hit the 1988 in the WWF project. But right now, we got to finish it out next week with the final two weeks of December 1987. And just a quick reminder, guys, follow me on social media, on Twitter, on X, at Wrestling Grenade. Follow me at Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. Subscribe to YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And I'd greatly appreciate if you gave it a try, that $5 all-access tier at Patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. And with all of that said, all of that out of the way, can't wait to close out another year, another project in the books next week. And as always, this is Ray Russell saying, from pillar to post and coast to coast, you pull the pin and I'll pick up the pieces right here on the Wrestling Memory Grenade. I'll see you next week. Don't miss it. Be there! say mentally retired it? No. Is that the way you no, put it? No, I would say eccentric. You're eccentric. Why don't you ask him, Jess? Why don't you ask him if he's a little retarded? Boom!